RMC is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your retro gaming with their joysticks featuring genuine Sanwar arcade parts. And OneClickPrint.com for your photos on canvas, acrylic, gifts and more. Local craftsmen and global delivery. Hello cave dwellers, I hope you're well. Today it's a straight up tutorial video, something we haven't done for a while and it's something I've been meaning to do for a long time with this particular bit of kit. This is a Philips CM8833 Mark II CRT monitor, most commonly used with the Amiga or Atari 16-bit computers. And I actually picked this up. You may recognize it if you're a long-time viewer. I picked it up when I did the Amiga 500 Trash to Treasure for an incredible, I think it was £25. And that wasn't for the monitor, that was for the Amiga 500 and the monitor. It was probably the luckiest pickup of my life uh, for all of about four to six months before this thing went pop and I'll show you the symptoms of it shortly. Many people consider this to be the ultimate CRT monitor for the Amiga, the ultimate classic monitor, all 14 inches of it. Um, it's hard to split this really between this and the Commodore 1084, which is practically the same monitor, albeit with one different um, video input. They're both great monitors, and if you can get hold of one, it's well worth saving, which is why we're gonna try and do it today, and hopefully uh, what we see today will help others to save theirs. So let me show you the symptoms and then we'll get to fixing it. So here's our power lead, we're going to plug it in. If you're wearing headphones, this makes something of a high pitch noise. So just be aware of that. I don't want to blow your ears off and I'll lean in so the microphone picks it up. Let's power it on now. Hopefully you heard that okay. I would liken the sound too. Do you remember those digital key rings, the sound effect key rings that you could get and they had all the different weapon sounds on? It sounds like the falling bomb on one of those key rings, the wee as the bomb goes down. Um, that's exactly what it sounds like. So if you're having the same problem, it should be very easy for you to identify the same symptoms. And I also encountered another problem there while I was testing it. I couldn't turn the thing off. It took me four or five attempts to get the power button to pop out again. Uh, I have a replacement power switch here. So we'll, pop, we'll change the power switch. But that's secondary to the main problem of that high pitch noise and nothing appearing on the screen. Now my understanding is if you're having those symptoms, the cause of the problem is something called the flyback transformer. And uh, well, anyone who's opened a CRT and had a look in will immediately recognize this part uh, because it's the part, let's unwrap it there. It's the part that has the anode cap that sits on the top of the monitor. The, the part that you, uh, you slide your tool under to discharge uh, the monitor to safely work on it. And it goes down to this unit here. So we're gonna have to change that whole thing out today. Hopefully that will solve our problem. So let's get the monitor open and get to work on it. For me, a trusty old CRT is the most authentic way to enjoy old games. You can try filters and effects on modern emulators to get a close approximation, but nothing beats the real thing. And nothing is quite as dangerous to work on in my hobby as a CRT. So if you're not familiar with discharging a CRT, please just don't open it. I'm not qualified to train you, only to document my own adventures for your entertainment, so please be very careful. Underneath the anode cap here, which looks like a suction cup, is where we'll discharge the CRT from, and we'll learn why later. Most monitors have a bleed resistor which will discharge them, but they can fail. And if this isn't discharged, it can hold tens of thousands of volts which would just love to use your body to find the earth. Always work on the assumption that they're ready to bite you. This is my discharge tool. There are many like it, but this is mine. It's a long rubber handled screwdriver with wire wrapped around the shaft, a bit of tape to make sure it doesn't fall off. And at the other end of the wire is a crocodile clip, which I've attached to the monitor's chassis. When you slide the screwdriver under the anode, you may or may not hear a pop or a crack. And sometimes you'll see a small spark as it discharges. but it's more than likely that you may hear nothing because it's already discharged through its resistor. The monitor is then safer to work on, but there are still some large capacitors on the board, so remember to check them before handling them, which we'll do shortly. We can then start to disassemble the monitor by removing the anode cap and popping off the neck board. 
Sometimes the neck board is covered in glue and you need to tackle that because we do need to access the board to perform this repair. And with that off, it's a case of unplugging all of the wires so that we can separate the CRT from the board and begin work on it. I recommend that you take pictures, maybe even a video as you go, so that you can look back later and remember where everything goes. Now you may be wondering what the flyback transformer is and that anode cap which we discharged under. Well, it's a high voltage unit that creates tens of thousands of volts. The bigger the monitor, the higher the voltage is. With it connected, the inside of the CRT is charged with those thousands of volts. But why does it do this? Well, here's a crude illustration to show you. The very basics of getting a picture on the CRT involves our electron guns at the back, which shoot electrons from the back to the front where the glass screen is. These electrons are negatively charged and traveling at around the speed of light. They have a lot of kinetic energy. When they smash into the screen, which is phosphor coated, it illuminates that phosphor to give us our picture. And then the electrons bounce back off the screen, at which point they've lost pretty much all of their kinetic energy. That's been transferred to become the light that we see on our picture because, of course, energy is transferred, it's never destroyed. Now, we don't want these electrons building up inside the CRT and hanging about, which is why the walls of the tube are highly charged with a positive charge from the flyback transformer. That charge comes from our transformer up the long red wire into the anode cap where the two little legs in the anode cap are making contact with the wall on the inside of the CRT. Our negative electrons then are attracted to the positively charged walls like a magnet and they slide along them to leave the CRT via another anode. So that's why we need that high voltage from our flyback transformer. If we lose high voltage, we'll just get a completely blank screen. And that means when you're troubleshooting, if there's any kind of picture at all, even if it's just a white picture on your screen, you know that the high voltage is there and therefore the flyback transformer is working. It's the high voltage on the walls of the CRT that we're discharging when we poke our screwdriver around under the anode cap. Back to our repair, our main board is now free of the CRT and we'll move that out of the way. So we've disassembled our monitor and now we want to swap out that flyback transformer, so how do we go about doing that? Well, safety first, once again, I did do a quick check on the larger capacitors on the board to make sure that they weren't holding any charge with the multimeter. And there was nothing more than a very small charge that wasn't going to hurt anyone. So I was happy that I could rub my beardy face all over this board now without fear. And maybe I will. Here's our replacement flyback transformer, which comes with its own anode cap and happily looks to be the correct part. I'll put the part number in the video description in case you need one yourself. There are also two very heavily insulated wires going off to the neck board. To make our life easier, I just cut these to get that neck board out of the way while we desolder the flyback transformer. And we'll do that using big old dollops of flux paste. That helps to get the solder working with the vacuum desoldering gun and our solder turned molten and came away very obligingly. There are also two plastic clips holding it in place. With a wiggle, it was then removed. So we'll give the area clean with some IPA and then put our replacement in and solder it into place. I'm working on this at around 340 degrees C and that seems to be plenty enough to get those big blobs of solder onto the pads. Once soldered in place, we then clean up the flux and that's the transformer in. And the two leads coming from it now go over to the neck board. One lead is a very simple job, it's just soldered into the board. The other is a little bit trickier. It feeds into the plastic casing here, which has four tabs around it to pop the top open and remove the cable. This was actually a real pain to get open and no doubt there's an engineer's tool somewhere that squeezes all four of those tabs and opens it up easily, but my method involved careful prising and poking with a screwdriver and a scalpel to try and get it open without breaking anything which I did successfully, but it took a lot of patience. Now the cable is not soldered inside, it's just pinched in place, so it's easy to release and then feed our new cable into. We'll make sure the replacement is in nice and tight, and then I just trimmed the end off to make sure that it fits in as we put the lid back on. What you should never do with this is splice and rejoin the wire in the middle. I know it might seem easier to do that way, but there's a reason that there's a lot of thick insulation on this wire. You're putting yourself and anyone else who works on it at risk if you trust insulation tape to stop 20,000 volts from hitting you. 
so please don't splice it. With the cable snapped into place, I'll just solder in the second cable, and then our flyback transformer is replaced, and hopefully we have a working CRT. But while we're in here, I will swap out the power switch, which is far less involved, so I'll just show you that quickly. The desoldering gun fires into action, which is an essential tool here in the cave. Do yourselves a favour and treat yourself to one, I'll put a link in the description to it and very quickly the old switch is removed. You'll see when we remove it, it's not quite a like-for-like -like replacement that I have here. The original switch is on the left and our replacement is on the right. The metal plate on the neck of the switch is purely for mechanical support. The legs go through the board and are soldered into place to take the strain off the solder joints when you're pushing that switch on and off. And my new one doesn't line up with the holes in the board. The switch itself does, just not that neck, that metal part there. My crude solution to solve this was to prise the plate off of the old switch and then put it onto the new one, which was a bit destructive on our old switch and a few bits of plastic snapped off of it, but I wasn't too worried about that and I was much more careful with then applying it to the new switch. And with that swapped over, the new switch went very quickly into place, I soldered it on and it turned on and off every single time when I pressed it. So. That's a very effective and quick repair that anyone with this kind of monitor should do because they always, always die. But has it all been worth it? There's only one way to find out. Let's get it all back together, get it safely inside its plastic casing, and we'll power it on to see if we get a picture or a small nuclear explosion in the cave. I hope it's the former, but the latter would make for good TV. Be sure to plug everything back in where it should be, especially the black CRT ground cable. If you don't do that, you're going to build up a big static charge, and that will want to find its way out, potentially with a snap through the screen and into your hand. So double check those black ground wires from the CRT make sure they're connected. Okay, we're over at the main desk here now so I can show you it in action. And I thought what could be more appropriate to test our Philips monitor with than a Philips CDI. It was the closest thing to hand, but it seems like a good test and I'll test it out with Space Ace. And uh, yes, I have got my Christmas jumper on now. Christmas is fast approaching, so I threw that on. So let's power it on. Let's pop the game in and uh, hopefully you'll see it running here. Space Ace, defender of justice, truth, and the planet Earth. Ace is being attacked by the evil commander Borf. Hold your fire. Who is that creep? Borf. Earth means a surrender to me. No way, Borf, old buddy. Oh! Ah, I've been hit by the Infanto Ray. Earth means a surrender to me. Struggle with Dexter to regain his manhood. Destroy the Infanto Ray. Defeat the evil Borf. Hey, hey Borf. <laughs> Come on, Kimberly, let's go. I've been hit. Ah! Be valiant, space warrior. The fate of Earth is in your hands. Look at that. Space Ace in all its Don Bluth animated glory. It looks fantastic. Now, the reason I'm not jumping around at this point going, it works, it works, is because I did test it. Uh, 10 minutes ago uh, to see that it was working and I had to make a few adjustments. Now there was a spanner thrown in the works that had me scratching my head for a while which was that one of my cables was broken and I thought ah we've got a deeper problem here the video signal is not making its way um, through the to the CRT to be displayed and we're gonna have to recap it and this that and the other. Actually no it was just a dodgy cable so as soon as I swapped the cable out I got a picture but it was a very very bright picture and if we look at the old flyback I can explain why. There are two pots on the transformer. We've got screen at the bottom, the higher that is the brighter the picture goes and at the top we've got focus which obviously pulls us into focus and you can see it's got this yellow paint or glue on it where it's been set and then glued into place in the factory so it's not adjusted. So we had to adjust this on mine. I had to take the screen down so it wasn't quite so bright and then just draw the focus in. Now the problem with that in this particular monitor is it's mounted this way round. So the controls are here and to get to them you have to use a long screwdriver or if you have the correct tool, a long plastic tool that a TV repairman used to have. 
through the monitor and then you have to adjust it. And I'm not so happy about sticking metal screwdrivers into this thing when it's turned on. So I had to turn it off, adjust, turn it on, and just do that a few times until I had it right. On a lot of monitors, it's the other way around. So you can keep it on and you can safely adjust it here. So that's worth mentioning and worth knowing if you're doing this yourself. And of course we replaced the switch and that's working perfectly fine. So I'm really pleased. I'm feeling a lot more confident now about working on CRT monitors. I've learned a lot along the way. That hasn't gone off, that's just gone to sleep. Um, <laughs> there we go. And uh, I have got a couple more broken CRTs up in the loft which I need to bring down and, and tackle. And if I come across anything interesting and we can learn some more lessons along the way, then I'll certainly share them with you. But for now, the old Philips CRT is happily working and will take pride of place in the cave. I hope you've learned something along the way today. Thank you for watching. Take care and see you in the next video. If you enjoy my content and would like to support the cave while receiving a completely ad-free experience and access to releases one week before they go public, then visit patreon.com forward slash retro man cave and join the official cave dwellers. Thank you for your support.